Hi, I'm Jean Shaproff and I'm on a mission. Anyone can be a philanthropist. My television show came from my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. Won't you join me? Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shaparoff, and this show is designed to highlight philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. With us today, Judith Case Windsor. She's a businesswoman, an LGBTQ activist and advocate. Let's all welcome Judith Kaysen Windsor. Judith? Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jean. It's good to see you. Now, Judith, you were the longtime partner of Edie Windsor, and also you were her spouse for, I think, a year. Can you tell our audience a little bit about exactly who Edie Windsor was and why she's so important for the LGBTQ community and their marriage and, and the future of all of us? You know, I couldn't be more proud of Edie Windsor. You know, Edie Windsor was about the statue of you. <laughs> you know, she was, she was tiny, but she was fierce. And Edie did not accept, you know, the, in, the injustice and, and, and the lack of dignity that she and her partner of 44 years and then me and her partner, you know, things had changed at that point. But she was with someone for 44 years and the law and, 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 the, and society did not accept them as a couple. And she could not stand the injustice. And she couldn't really stand the injustice for any civil rights group. You know, that's why she really didn't consider herself a, a great feminist. She was really about civil rights and rights for all individuals. Yes, and she's famous for changing marriage laws, specifically getting legislation passed that would allow same-sex marriage. Can you discuss that a little bit so that our audience has a better idea of who she was and how hard she worked to change the legislation? Yeah, um, Edie was the first marriage equality ambassador for New York for Empire State Pride Agenda starting about 25 years ago, like a long time she worked on marriage equality. Um, you know, people talk a lot about the federal law. You know, when the federal law Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996. When he signed it in 1996, Edie and Thea had already been together for 30 years. So that was, that was quite painful for them. And she, again, you know, she believed in this country, she believed in the constitution and she just couldn't stand it. And then what put her over the edge was when Thea passed away where they had built a life together. They had bought an apartment together. They had bought a ha this lovely home in uh, Southampton together. When, e when Thea passed away, you know, Edie was suing the United States government on behalf of the Thea Spire estate. So she had to pay, and everybody talks about the $363,000 that she paid in federal taxes. She also, even though marriage was legal in 2011 in New York State, and she had to pay $256,000 to the state. So it was well over a half million dollars. So let's backtrack a little. Can you explain specifically to our audience what mm -hmm. DOMA was, the defensive Defense of Marriage Act, so that our yeah, audience yeah. can understand what that was and why she was against that. Okay, the Defense of Marriage Act is in, I mean, we can get really technical and legal, but the Defense of Marriage Act defined marriage as between one male and one female. And that was the law that she went after. And exactly what was she able to change about that and when, and how many years did it take her? Um, about two and a half, you know, she had to go through, you know, the New York Circuit Court, she had to go to the New York State Supreme Court, and then, you know, I, 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 it's not a joke, but it is, you know, to get a Supreme Court case, it's like finding a needle in a double haystack. You know how hard it is to get a Supreme Court case, and how they picked Windsor, I don't know, but, but they did, and, and when they picked it, it was, they called her the perfect plaintiff. She was absolutely the perfect plaintiff for this case. 
I remember reading about this on the cover of the New York Times. What year was this exactly? I can't remember the exact year. She, she started the case in about 2010, 2011, and she did the oral arguments in the end of March 2013, and the decision came down on June 26, 2013. And that was a very big day for the LGBTQ community because... I don't know if anybody so didn't cry. <laughs> yes. So now I want to go back to your life a little bit sure. and how you met Judith. And in our conversations, you mentioned to me that, she, I'm sorry, Edith always wanted to keep the relationship very quiet. What was that for? Was she afraid or what was that exactly? When we were talking about that, it was really when she was with Thea, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, you had to be very, very careful about being gay in the workplace or your home. You know, we just had the case last year, you know, the Bostock versus, you know, the EEOC. You know, one of those cases, the skydiver who unfortunately passed away, you know, he was out here on Long Island. You know, he was one of the three cases, you know, so, you know, we did the Civil Rights Act in 1964, yet, you know, in 2019, we're still fighting. That case two years ago was about not being able to fire somebody because they're gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Um, it was also about, you know, housing. It was also about, you know, uh, equal pay. I mean, it was, it was, it was a, a variety of things. And here we are 30, 40 years from the Civil Rights Act and we're still fighting these same battles. And I don't, I, I, I don't understand that. Edie couldn't understand it and I can't understand it. And today, do you still feel there is a lot of discrimination against the LGBTQ community or do you think that's dramatically changed? Because here in New York and in the Hamptons, it seems as if it's dramatically changed, but I can't say because I don't know what's happening in other parts of the country and the world. Yeah, um, no, I don't think it's changed. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, I work with many organizations, you know, with LGBT youth and LGBT elders and transgender youth and, and whatever, it, it is still a huge problem today. New York is, is a, little, a, a little more loose, you know, it's better, but you know, there is someone killed almost on a daily basis. Trans women of color, there have been like, I think 360 people who have been killed this year alone. And, you know, I talked to a lot of LGBTQ youth and, you know, they still struggle to come out. They're still, you know, horrified and terrified to tell their parents. They are, you know, teased at school. They are the, you know, over 50% of the homeless youth on the street because once you find out your child is gay, that's the only child that gets kicked out of their home. You know, no, no, no kid gets kicked out of their home because they have a learning disability or they have a disease or their behavioral problem or God forbid an opioid problem or whatever. The only reason children get kicked out of their homes is because they're LGBTQ youth. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the LGBTQ elders. They're now going into assisted living and nursing homes and they're having to go back into the closet because the people that they were peers with, you know, they think back of their lives in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Gay people were not accepted in those days. It was illegal to be gay. You know, they, they printed, you know, they, that, they didn't just arrest you. They printed your name in the newspaper. You were fired from your job. You're probably cut off from your family. You know, so it, it goes full circle. And so, we, no, we haven't gotten far. It's very sad to hear all of this. And then for children, especially because we have a hard enough time right now with the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic and everything going on in the world. And for parents not to accept their children because of gender identity or that, that would be in the case of a transgender child, but because a child is part of the LGBTQ community, I think it's, it's a crime really, um, because parents have to give love and they have to give understanding and we are all human beings. And so what advice will you give to young people who are just starting a family and, and maybe they 
have children and they see changes in their children's sexual preference, mm -hmm. how would you, what would you suggest that they do to make their child feel most loved and most wanted? In my estimation, it would be just to give a lot of love and support yeah, and, and, and tell them that it's okay. Yeah, that, that's, it's that simple. It's that simple. It's, it's love, it's support. It's also, you know, not just saying, okay, my kid's gay, but also, you know, maybe reading a book or watching, you know, a movie that has some LGBT characters or, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there. There's PFLAG, which is, you know, parents of lesbian and gays. There's SAGE, which is senior advocacy for gay elders. There's the LGBT center. There's the Harvey Milk High School. There are so many resources out there. So I, I could plug the, uh, the Edie Windsor Center, which is going to be the new healthcare center at Southampton Hospital, which I'm extremely proud of. But um, there are so many resources out there and so much information out there. You know, these children, they're not committing a crime. They just want to love who, uh, who they want to love. I agree completely. It's that, that simple. It's I that agree. simple. Yes, I agree with you completely that if you're a, um, an LGBTQ mm -hmm person, then you should be entitled to love who you want to love. We all need to love who we want to love. And what we're really missing right now in our world is kindness and understanding. And I think we come closer to understanding life when we allow people to be who they want to be. I want to move back to the transgender community. Sure. I've always read that they're having a very, very difficult time here in New York and really around the world. And what can we do to help that community? Uh, again, it goes back to the organizations and it goes back through the networking. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, I, I came out to Southampton in, in March and somebody I know from Callan Lord in New York had one of her patients from New Jersey out in Montauk and they went to several general practitioners and several doctors and they really didn't have the wherewithal to really take care of this child and give them the hormones and, and, and things that these transgender children need. And she called me and she's like, well, what can we do? And I'm like, let me call the Edie Windsor Center. And sure enough, we found them a doctor. We, 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 you know, we, saved, we saved this child's life. Can you tell our audience a little bit about the Edie Windsor Center at Southampton Hospital? I understand <laughs> after Edie passed away, South Hampton Hospital came to you and asked you to get involved. Tell our audience a little bit about that center and exactly what it is. I know it means so much to you and you're very, very involved. And now the Southampton Hospital is the Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. And I know it's a top priority for the hospital. Healthcare in general, I'm on the board of the Southampton Hospital Association and I know what a great job this hospital does to, to care for everyone in the community, regardless of their background or their finances. It's a, it's a hospital that allows everyone and everyone comes in and everyone is treated equally and fairly. But tell us a little bit about the Edie Windsor Center, please. Well, thank you for asking, since I did two shameless plugs on the Edie Windsor Center. Um, the, you know, the Southampton Hospital had an HIV and AIDS center. And when Edie passed away, you know, the board and, and several people from Southampton Hospital called me and asked me if they could change it to the Edie Windsor Center. And I said, I have a couple of conditions. And they said, what is your conditions? And I said, it needs to be changed from an HIV and AIDS center to cover full LGBTQ people. So it has to be HIV and AIDS. It has to be LGBT youth, LGBT elders, transgender youth. And then I said to Bob and, and Steve Bernstein, most important health care, mental health care services. And sadly, that's where we are. You know, I, I think a normal person would have anxiety this year. So, you know, some of the LGBT children who now have to be at home with parents who are unkind to them or have to be, you know, or, or missing hormone appointments because of COVID, mental health services is going to be a very significant issue going forward and you know no question yeah mental health it, issues because and, and, of this pandemic absolutely are going to be even greater 
um, a, a bigger problem than before, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But what we all need to do is try to support one another, show kindness. And there is a lot of fear. I don't think there's a person on the face of this earth who's not afraid of the COVID virus. And right now with the vaccine slowly being rolled out, everyone's very excited about the possibilities at, of the end of this pandemic, but still we need to be very, very careful regardless of who you are and, and what you do. We all have to wear masks, we have to social distance, and then we have to keep washing our hands. Now getting back to our guest, Judith Kaysen Windsor, she's an advocate and a um, and an activist in the LGBTQ community. She's giving us a little insight into the life that she has and then the life she had with Edie Windsor, who was a great reformer for the LGBTQ community in allowing or getting a legislation passed for the marriage of same-sex individuals. So now um, getting back to you, and your life and, <laughs> and, and how you're handling this pandemic. Are you able to handle it? And, and what advice would you give to our listeners? Um, day at a time. I mean, <laughs> not that I'm in a, you know, you know, you just, you just have to take it as it comes and, you know, and listen to the scientists and listen to the doctors and, you know, um, you know, you should be exercising, you should be volunteering. There, there's plenty of things to do, you know, that don't require, you know, of course, wear your mask or whatever, but there are things that you can do. I've done a lot of volunteering. I've done a lot of Zoom calls. I was very active in some of the political campaigns. I am always in contact with all the LGBTQ organizations, always working on something like that. Um, you just, you keep yourself busy, you know? We just, you, you know, and there's plenty of things to do. You know, there's meals to be delivered. There's medication that can be, that, that is another thing I talked about with the Edie Windsor Center is I said, you know, I want it to also be, you know, not just a center for LGBTQ. I want it to be a center for everybody where if somebody, you know, can't really get to CVS or get to the drugstore and get their medication to have a whole network, you know, or if like, you know, you need a flu shot you should be able to go to the Edie Windsor Center and get your flu shot. And the Edie Windsor Center is, you know, a, you know, a, a center that everybody can go to. And it's sort of a conduit into the hospital where you could get a general practitioner or a gynecologist or a urologist or a cardiologist. You know, I want everybody to, you know, be using this center. And what is so important is, you know, I, I want people to be checking on the elderly in this time. You know, it's one thing, you know, kids have video games and you know, they can FaceTime with their friends and they can TikTok and they can do some things. But there's some there's some older people out there that I think are quite lonely. And, you know, maybe we can maybe we, you know, even visit them through a window. You know, there's there's definitely things that can be done. And that's another thing I would like with the Edie Windsor Center out here. You know, we have a nice, beautiful, small knit community out here, but we just need to start to really start to connect with each other. So important. And now regarding fundraising for the ED Windsor Center, are you involved in that effort? I understand, and I've been to some of your events, you have a barbecue every yes. May. Do you think you'll be having that this year? And for our viewers who want to donate, how can they do that? Um, I hope we are able to have the Edie Windsor Backyard Barbecue. It's always the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. Um, that is something that Edie, Edie and Thea bought this house in 1968. And they have always had a party the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend to bring the community back together. You know, people go back to the city or they go back to the Queens or they go, you know, they go back to wherever they did. But then when they come here, Edie and Thea always had this party and it was to bring the community back together. So I hope we can have it this year because unfortunately we couldn't have it last year and, you know, we weren't prepared to go virtual and nobody really, nobody knew what to do. But this year, at least we could go virtual. Um, in order to donate, you can always donate to Southampton Hospital specifically. Um, you can earmark it for the Edie Windsor Center, or also Edie Windsor has a website and it has all of her, her philanthropic things that are named after her. She has about a dozen or so things that are named after her. And one of them is the Edie Windsor Healthcare Center and you can click right on there and you can, you can donate. 
Yes, and many of our viewers, they may not have the funds to write a large check, but remember, even a very tiny donation, collectively, all these donations together make a big difference. Now, what about volunteers? Are you accepting volunteers to work at the center, or is there a way that they can help out uh, virtually through Zoom? Because right now, as things really seem to be tightening up even more and more with the COVID pandemic, what opportunities do you offer for volunteers? Um, right now, we're, we're kind of in transition. You know, they are moving, you know, the E.D. Windsor Center now is over by Southampton Hospital on Meeting House Lane. They're moving it over to Hampton Bays. There's an atrium over there, and they're going to have several office facilities. You know, they're taking over that atrium. And the reason why we put it in Hampton Bays is because we looked at the demographics of the people who use the E.D. Windsor Center. And, you know, it was from Islip to Montauk. So instead of putting it where Southampton Hospital is, closer to Southampton, we put it in Hampton Bays because that was more geographically desirable for it to be there. Um, so we're in transition and, you know, we're going to have more than double the amount of space. There's going to be several rooms for, you know, uh, um, social workers. And then there's also going to be some light medical care. We have doctors who have volunteered X amount of days or X amount of hours who will be there on site. So, you, you know, if you go in there with a you know, a sinus infection or something small where you, know, you really kind of don't want to go into the hospital, but, you know, you can go over there and certainly they, they can, you know, help you with that. Um, well, that's very exciting. And when do you expect that the center will open up in Hampton Bays? It is supposed to open up the end of February, but I have, you know, how construction goes. So I have a feeling it's going to be probably the ribbon cutting will probably hopefully be early March, mid-March, something of that nature. We, you know, we might do a soft opening and have, you know, a local kind of thing, but I'd like the opening to be much bigger. You know, I'd like to have, you know, invite more people, you know, have more people come, you know, whether they be political or activists or whoever, I'd like to have a bigger opening at some point. You know, if I can't have the uh, event Memorial Day weekend, you know, I'll push it back throughout the summer. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've done all kinds of things to raise money for the Edie Windsor Center. I've done live, au I've, I've done a silent auction where I donated this house and somebody took this house and it was their largest auction item, which <laughs> shocked me, but I was thrilled. It was their largest, uh, you know, priced auction item. And this, these two women couples came here and stayed here for a weekend and I gave them an extra day and they, everything was great. Um, I'll do anything I can possibly do to raise money for the Edie Windsor Center. And I agree with you, and I'll quote Edie very quickly, that, um, you know, she always used to say, you know, you did it with dollars, and it matters. Every dollar matters. So, you know, you know, when I talk to people about fundraising, they're like, I don't have that kind of money. I'm like, you know, you, don't buy a sweater at the Gap. It's $25. Like, it adds up. You know, you think about some of, you know, the political campaigns, they do this on, you know, I get these things, chip in a dollar, chip in three dollars, chip in five dollars, chip in seven dollars. Every dollar matters. It adds up. No question. You and you have to write these big checks, you no. know, you write these small checks. I write yes, small and I, checks and big checks all the time. Yes. And I say to my audience always, never feel that your smaller donations are insignificant because not. collectively collectively they add up and they create change and so today's guest is a very very interesting woman she's carrying on the legacy of her former spouse Edith Windsor and she's really helping to shape yeah. the entire community out here and making a, a safe haven and a place for members of the LGBTQ community to go to feel, to get medical care, to get psychological care, and to really help. So Judith, we have a few minutes left. What advice do you want to give to the next generation? How can they help you? How can they get involved? And, and let's talk a little bit about acceptance and the willingness to be accepting and, and to move forward so that, that we don't go backwards, but that we move forward. Right. Um, just, you know, be involved, stay engaged, know what's going on in your community, whether it's your next door neighbor, 
whether it's the person two doors down that has a pride flag in front of their house and, you know, somebody's harassing them, you know, whether it's big or small, just stay engaged in what's going on. Don't ever take anything for granted. Rights, human rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, you know, civil rights, they're very fragile. Don't ever take them for granted. They, they, they could, things could happen. Yes, and the rights of all beings matter. And we've Absolutely. had a lot of problems this year or in 2020 concerning racial justice. Well, the rights of all human beings matter. And Judith, I have one final question. Who's on the wall behind you? That is the indomitable Edie Windsor herself. That was the same picture that we used for her memoir, A Wild and Precious Life. Um, that is the picture where she was Time Magazine's Person of the Year, runner up to the Pope in 2013. You know, Edie changed the game. She sure did. With us on today's episode of Successful Philanthropy was Judith Case in Windsor. I'm Jean Shafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.